All right, guys, today we're doing an interview with my father, John Frederick. Say hi to the camera. How's it going, guys? And he's got the hiccups. Yeah, it's always fun. <laughs> All right. For an interview. Let's get this thing started. Uh, so, describe your childhood for us. Childhood, okay. I was born in Jasper, <laughs> Texas, a little old town in Jasper. My dad happened to be working there. Um, we're actually from Mauriceville, Texas, but my dad was working there, so I was born there. <clears throat> Probably about two, we moved back to Mauriceville, uh, Frederick Lane, where I grew up. And uh, had a really good childhood, man. Had a great dad, a great mom. Um, mother was very overprotective, so I stayed out of trouble. Uh, dad was easy going, but uh, he kept us out of trouble as well. But really didn't have any issues growing up. There was really no drama, no abuse. So, man, I, I, I can't complain about anything. It's, it's crazy. Uh, you know, when I, a lot of people tell me their horror stories of their childhood and then, like, I can't relate to it at all, which I'm glad I can't. But then again, I, it kind of makes me feel bad that, you know, I had it so great and then they didn't. And so, <clears throat> but yeah, I had a, I had a good childhood. Uh, I moved in with my dad when I was 16, and so I did have a wild couple of years, <laughs> because, like I said, dad was a bit more lenient, but, uh, yeah, that was my childhood. Okay, so your transition from childhood to young adulthood, how did that one go? To young adulthood, like, like about 16? Yeah, about 16, let's hear more about that one. Shoot, okay, I moved in with my dad, and, uh, <clears throat> I got my driver's license and then like two days later, I think, we moved to Arkansas because uh, my dad's sister had a big ranch in Arkansas. So I moved, we moved up there to kind of oversee the ranch because she got killed in a plane crash. So uh, <clears throat> 16 and kind of able to go do whatever I wanted. It was crazy. That's some wild night. Now I never did anything to get in trouble. I never, you know, did drugs or you know went and did criminal activity anything like that but uh there was just a lot and of course back then too that was in 1989 so there was really nothing to do other than run the drag and you know meet girls and hang out and stuff like that go to the pool hall shoot pool play arcade games you know old school and plus arkansas was like i don't know 10 20 years behind you know where we were from in Texas, so <clears throat> pay phones, you know what a pay phone is? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> doing an age check there. Pay phones in Texas were a quarter, and Arkansas they were still a dime, so it was 10 cents to make a call on a pay phone. So that tells you kind of, you know, how much further back they were. So uh, <clears throat> it was very laid back in country up there, so we just drove around, you know, people built hot rods stuff like that so it was mostly just um girl chasing not not gonna lie that's that's really all there was to do in arkansas was chase women so we did that and then went to some crank it up contest you know it's back when uh car stereos were just getting big you know big speakers uh kicker just came out was released so we were into a lot of that play some old beastie boys tapes <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So, uh, out of all the Beastie Boys <clears throat> songs, if you could choose one, which one would you thump right now? Mm. Paul Revere. Foom, 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 foom. Yeah. <laughs> I think it has probably, it probably had the best hit of most of the songs. But Brass Monkey had a, a really good bass line, but something about that Paul Revere, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it was like they. I think they said it's like a reverse bass or something like that. But anyway, yep. it's pretty hard. All right. So, uh, out of young adulthood, what was your original plan for what you were going to do with your life after you got out of high school? <clears throat> Good question. So there was no original plan. Um, I didn't really know. <clears throat> so I know my senior year, um, there was a lot of recruiters, you know, circling the school like freaking buzzards and uh, my dad was in the army and he so he was telling me yeah, have you thought about going to the army I'm like not really you know I hadn't thought about going to the military at all uh, not really something I thought about doing and uh, 
he was, my sister was going to college at the time, so he was paying for pretty much everything for her to go to college, you know, kind of full ride type thing to get her through. And uh, he said, I, I really, I don't think I can, do, you know, put both of you through at the same time. So you're gonna have to figure out something else to do. And uh, so he talked about the army again, and this is when Desert Storm was still going on back in 1991. And uh, I remember one night we were sitting on the couch and we put on CNN and they were showing footage from Desert Storm. And there was these guys, you know, like crawling through trenches and crap like that and then bullets flying over them and all this stuff. And I remember I said, Dad, who, who are the guys right there? The ones who are, you know, like down in the mud and stuff like dodging bullets and all that. He said, oh, yeah, that's the army right there. I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not joining the army. <laughs> no, thank you. know, that, that kind of put me off. I, I really didn't want to go there where they were and, and be part of that. So I kind of said no to the army. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you're going to get a lot of haters. Don't hate on me. But uh, so my dad met, he met a Navy recruiter in Walmart and the Navy recruiter, you know, gave him a kind of a little spiel. And uh, dad said, uh, I talked to the Navy recruiter and he had some really cool stuff to say. Why don't you go down and just hear what he has to say? Ah, oh, why not? You know, what, what else am I going to do? So I went down and told the Navy recruiter, he said, what, what type of stuff do you want to do as a career? I said, oh, I'm really into like electronics, you know, like I mess around with circuit boards and stuff and I take apart TVs and mess with the components. I like that kind of stuff. And uh, so he, had, he said he had a job available called a sonar technician and that's operating underwater sonar that hunts for submarines and uh, which deals with a lot of electronics because the sonar is basically ran by all electronics, circuit boards, circuitry, stuff like that. And when the stuff fails, you have to repair it, you know, pull out circuit boards, put in new ones, maybe do some micro uh, circuitry work, uh, <clears throat> which there's another job in the Navy called electronics technician. They really do the uh, down to the component level circuit board type stuff. So I really didn't get to do that, but uh, it was kind of part of the job description. I said, hey, that sounds kind of cool. It had um, an accelerated advancement as part of the contract, there was a sign-on bonus and stuff, so I said, hey, sign me up, whatever, dude, you know, six years. So I signed a six-year contract immediately. <clears throat> My mother almost had a heart attack because she was still in Texas, you know, I was in Arkansas doing this, and uh, so I just called her on the phone and said, oh, yeah, join the Navy. What? You know, she panicked because she didn't know anything about it, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's how that went down. I joined in March, graduated in May, of 91 and I left in October for boot camp. Nice, so uh, how did your experience with the military go? <clears throat> what world did you go? What did you see oh, man. that you'd like to get into? Okay, well, let's see. Again, of course, I joined the Navy in uh, October 91 and I stayed in for 20 years. I retired October 2011. Um, it was a long 20 years and uh, I mean, you know, I had some good experiences, but overall, I mean, the, the military, uh, I guess it, maybe it depends on who you talk to, but it's, it's not really fun. And uh, I don't think it's meant to be fun. It's, it's very arduous. It's hard. It's a hard life. Um, now, I mean, of course, there are, you know, fun times. Now, I was in the Navy, so uh, <clears throat> I would have to go out to sea for, you know, two, three weeks at a time. Uh, I did go on a six-month Mediterranean cruise. Uh, it's the only cruise I got to go on, which we went to Europe. Uh, we left the States and went to uh, Bermuda. It was our first stop. Then we went to England, then Denmark. We went through the Kiel Canal. and through, So we went through Germany uh, through the Kiel Canal to get it to the uh, Baltic Sea. Then we went to Denmark. We did an exercise off the coast of Denmark. Then we came back through the uh, Kiel Canal, went to France. We actually went into dry dock in France. So we had a three week dry dock period that we were just off. You know, you couldn't go on the ship. So we just got to go hang out in France for three weeks, which is a, is a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, really, I think out of all the places I went, people ask me this all the time. I think France was probably my favorite. 
Uh, <clears throat> I met some people there. I met a guy who I'm still friends with today, uh, who I hung out most of the time I was there. I hung out with him. We go to his apartment. His wife, uh, his wife cooked us uh, crab legs, like these big steamed, huge crab legs one night. It's a delicacy. And he spoke English too, so it was really cool that he could take me around France and, you know, he was there to interpret and all that stuff. So had a lot of fun there. We left there and went to Portugal. And then we went to Rota, Spain, Cartagena, Spain, and Palma de Mallorca, Spain. And we left from there and went to the Bahamas and then back to Texas. At that time, I was on a minesweeper. Um, I'd switched from anti-submarine sonar to mine hunting sonar. So I moved to uh, Corpus Christi, Texas is where the ships were stationed at that time. That was in 95 when I got there and uh, I became a mine hunter. So <laughs> that was uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> Having to go look for underwater mines, you can't see them, but if you miss one, it's all over. Uh, <clears throat> so I did do, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my career just review real quick. So I started off in San Diego. I was there for about a year and a half. Went to boot camp, went to my main school. It's in the Navy. It's called an A school. That's where they teach you sonar, just in general, sonar principles. You know, underwater acoustic analysis, stuff like that. How sound travels through water, sound propagation, what affects sound travel in water. You learn that type of basic stuff. Is you about ACDC theory and circuits, ohms, diodes, uh, how all those things, you know, work. So in case you have to work on that. Then I went to my follow-on specialized school. They call it Sea School in the Navy. And uh, that was for... Uh, and a submarine stuff at that time. Uh, I went to uh, <clears throat> I went to a school. The school I went to was the very last class to go through that school, and then they sold all those systems to the Greek Navy. So basically, I went through that school for nothing because there were no more systems in the U.S. Navy out in the fleet anymore. They had taken them all off. Now, this system uh, fired ASROCs, anti-submarine rockets, out of uh, a rock, kind of a rocket launcher on the front of the ship. But they were shifting to what's called VLS, Vertical Launch System. And that's where you had a uh, kind of a flat thing on the front of the ship. And the little lids opened up and the rockets fired out of the, the deck up and out. Instead of being in a little launcher that aimed around, these would shoot out of the deck. Uh, <clears throat> so they had upgraded all my systems. So when I got to the fleet, I didn't have any experience with anything. So I had to, I had to learn from scratch. Uh, so unfortunately, when I, on my first ship, it was a destroyer in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> I ended up having to have emergency surgery. And the ship was leaving for six months. And I got pulled off and put on what's called limited duty for a year. Because I had to have an, an additional surgery after that. So... When that was over, I had to pick new orders, and that's how I got minesweepers down to Corpus Christi. And uh, so I did that for four years in Corpus, came back to Orange, Texas, my hometown, did a recruiting tour for three years, left here, and went to Bahrain for a year, which is just off the coast of Saudi Arabia. It's a little island in the Arabian Gulf. <clears throat> uh, I got there, <coughs> excuse me, I got there in June of 2002. And uh, I was supposed to leave in June of 2003. Well, in March of 2003, we went to war. <laughs> so um, my ship and three other U.S. minesweepers, along with some British minesweepers, we had to go. There's a river that goes in between the border of Kuwait and Iraq. We had to go into that river, which went all the way to a town called Basra, or Basra. I, I can't remember how many miles it is. It's pretty far. But we all had to go in there and clear all the underwater mines out of this river so the humanitarian aid ships could get access to the ports and resupply our troops. So uh, that was scary. There's not a whole lot I want to talk about that, at least not during this interview, but uh, <clears throat> it, it was scary. We, we, did get, we did get attacked by some insurgents uh, on the the coast or on the side of the river 
but uh, there were a lot of mines out there. Um, I remember one morning the uh, the tide went out and it so the river kind of shrank in, and we could actually see the mines. They had what's called bottom mines that were sitting on the bottom every I don't know I don't remember the distance they were, but we could see them. You know, as far as you could see up the river, these mines were sitting there. Now before that, you know, we would pick them up on the sonar and. Uh, <clears throat> We would send a, a little explosive charge down and, and detonate it, and it would it basically cracks the case, lets the mine fill with salt water, and it kind of you know shorts itself out basically. But <clears throat> we didn't have any visual confirmation, so we never really you know saw it. I mean, on the sonar, you get these little dots that give off characteristics of a mine, but I mean, you really don't know if that's what it is or not. So you go down there and detonate your thing and cross your fingers so uh, but when when we when we saw them you know lying in the river that's when it, it was really you know really real for us and uh, the pucker factor of a thousand so <laughs> but we made it through there you know somehow we all got to come home and uh, I remember uh, when I flew into Houston I remember I dropped onto the <laughs> I got off the plane I just dropped onto the the floor it's like oh Oh, thank God, you know, I'm, I made it home, so it was scary. So after that, um, I went back down to Corpus to another minesweeper, <clears throat> the USS Chief, which was my final ship. And I left there in uh, 05. I did a tour in San Antonio on an Air Force base, Lackland Air Force Base. Left there and went to back to Virginia Beach for my last tour. I was attached to a CB battalion in Virginia Beach uh, from 2008 to 2011, and that's when I retired and I moved back home. Nice. Yay. So once you got back home, <clears throat> what was your transition from military to civilian oh. <laughs> life and then into acting? Okay. Yeah, so when I, when I first got home... Uh, it really sucked. It, it was hard. My first two years were really, really hard. Um, you know, transitioning from 20 years in the military to to civilian, it, it's, for me, from my experience, it was very, very difficult because, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. So, at the height of my career, after 20 years in the Navy, I'm a chief, you know, I'm up here in this upper managerial position. Uh, you know, I've got hundreds of troops, you know, I train these people and I live with them and watch them grow and, and I mean, that was what I lived for, you know, was to, to watch my troops grow and, and, you know, teach, you know, teach the troops and stuff like that. Anyway, the next day I have nothing. I'm in this little town, you know, no Navy anywhere around it. And nobody knows anything about me at all. I mean, I'm in the Navy. Next day, I'm just nothing. I'm just this guy. You know, I walk in the store. Nobody knows I just spent 20 years in the Navy. They didn't even know what I did in the Navy. They don't know how hard it was. I mean, they don't know what all I went through. They, they know nothing. And then I don't know these people. I don't know what am I supposed to do out here. You know, I don't know anybody anymore. Don't have any friends. Um... <clears throat> Luckily, my kids were here, and my sister, you know, so I got family, uh, but I don't know what the heck I'm going to do with myself. You know, do I go try to get a job? Can I even work with these people? You know, because it's going to be way different, you know, working with the, the people who don't have military experience. So it was, it was the first two years were very hard. It was very depressing. Uh, there were days where I just laid in the bed and didn't do anything. Uh, there were times where I didn't leave the house for a week. Um, it was rough, rough for a couple of years. And <clears throat> I started, uh, you know, applying for jobs and nobody would hire me. So I have 20 years in the Navy, a bachelor's degree in management. Oh, by the way, I got my degree while I was in the Navy. Forgot to mention that. And I couldn't get a job anywhere. I was either overqualified or there were no positions available or I didn't have specific experience that they needed for, you know, whatever. 
So <clears throat> I decided to go to uh, go back to college. Everybody kept telling me, well, you're going to have to be a process operator at a plant. Cause that's where all the money's made in this town. And there's a lot of those positions available. So I started going to, to school for process operator. <clears throat> and uh, after my first semester, I ended up getting hired at a uh, rubber manufacturing plant, a chemical plant. And uh, I did that for about six months. Um, couldn't survive the heat. <laughs> Fell out one time and uh, that was about it. They, <clears throat> they said you had heat you know, issues while you were in the Navy, heat stroke, and uh, you, you're probably not gonna make it. You're gonna fall into the equipment and die or something like that. So probably best you, that you don't work here. So left there. Um, maybe a year later hired on it at a different chemical plant and uh, the same thing happened. The heat almost killed me. So <laughs> I was like, what do I, I'm going to be stuck in an office or something somewhere. So <clears throat> I didn't get to do that. Then I got hired on as a uh, shift supervisor at a different plant and uh, me and you actually worked at that plant together mm -hmm. for a while. So we I think we hired in this about the same time. Yeah, I got there a couple weeks before you did, but you got me the job. Yeah, yeah. So that, <laughs> that and I mean, that was okay. The heat wasn't that bad, um, <clears throat> mainly because I wasn't actually out there, you know, operating the machines and doing the materials like you guys were. Uh, you know, I had an office, so I was able to kind of control that. So I think I did that for a little over a year maybe and uh, decided I just want to stay retired. I can't deal with these people. <laughs> it, it was hard to deal with, with people. <clears throat> I mean, e even there, you, and you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, I decided to stay retired. And then a few years later, we evacuated for Hurricane Harvey. And I met a guy while we were evacuated at a restaurant. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we became Facebook friends. And I saw he posted a picture of him with... Uh, Stallone and Schwarzenegger, and I'm like, how the hell did he get to meet these, you know, these mega actors like this, you know? So I asked him, and he said, I, I did some background and stunt work uh, on Expendables, one of the Expendables movies, and I said, dude, I've always wanted to be an actor, man, like, all growing up, you know, I'm a movie fanatic, you know, I'm a movie buff, I quote movies all the time, I mean, I just love movies, I love acting, I love the art, the craft, everything about it, so... Uh, I was never able to pursue it because obviously I was in the military for most of my life. So uh, he gave me a, a phone number to a casting company he used before. I called them, the casting company up and they said, we have a feature film that's wrapping up. We need some extras, you know, to work on the film. It's four days long. And uh, he said, why don't you come out and be an extra? and get to know what a film set looks like, you know, meet the people, see if it's something you even like or you'd even be interested in pursuing. And uh, <clears throat> I did, and it was incredible. I loved it. It was shot up just north of Dallas, Texas. And uh, I had a blast. I met a lot of people, did a lot of networking. And um, it wasn't long after I did that, I got uh, somebody sent me a... a a casting call that they they saw uh, I don't know if it was on the internet or something but anyway they thought it was something that might fit me and it was for a uh, <clears throat> a show on investigation discovery called disappeared about people who just disappear without a trace nobody can find them and there was a story about this girl who got off her school bus and just vanished nobody ever saw her again and uh, they were looking for someone who resembled the dad, and I guess I resembled him. Anyway, I applied for it, and uh, this guy called me from NBC in New York and said, Hey, you got the look we're looking for. We want to cast you in this, you know, this show. And uh, he sent me an email with all the details. And anyway, I went and shot that. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> even though it was a lead role, it was what's called a no sound up which means that uh, none of the dialogue that we had could be heard. You could see our mouths talking, but you didn't hear any of the dialogue because the commentator and the people they were interviewing, they were talking the whole time over us, you know, doing our scene. So that was uh, disappointing, but it was still a good experience, you know, getting to do that. 
And then not long after that, <clears throat> some people who I had networked with on my first extra job, they sent me a, an email that said, hey, there's a new Tom Hanks movie coming out. It's supposed to be a, a Navy movie. Since you were retired Navy, maybe you'd be interested in it. So I looked into that and I went to an open casting call in uh, Baton Rouge, I think it was. As a matter of fact, I was even on the news. They, <laughs> the Baton Rouge News had me. They, I don't know why they interviewed me, but they did. I think I was finished with all my processing before everyone else. So they said, hey, can we interview you? Sure. So <clears throat> anyway, I applied um, I applied to be an extra. Because remember, I had not done any, like, you know, big principal acting work yet. I had just done a few extras. And so I applied to be an extra in this Navy movie. And so, you know, I worked my way up from there. And uh, when I did, I sent a picture of me in my dress blues, right? This is my final picture when I retired from the Navy. I'm in full dress blues as a chief. And it's, when you see the picture, it's impressive looking, you know. It's a bunch of gold and medals and crap everywhere. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> they're, uh, they have a military advisor. Now, this guy is a retired marine captain his name is Dell Dye wonderful wonderful human being one of my personal heroes uh, so he was in charge of training all of the main actors uh, to you know kind of act military you know because they're all flying in from all over the place they're gonna be acting like sailors but they have no military experience so his job was to train them up so <clears throat> he said well let me let me look through this, you know, the data bank of extras and see if there's some guys I can pull to help me. When he saw my picture, you know, and he's a retired Marine, so he knows military guys. Well, he saw a picture of a Navy chief, and so he said, oh, hey, who, who is this guy? You guys have a Navy chief at your data bank? I want to talk to this guy. You know, y'all give him my number, tell him to call me immediately. So they called Central Casting in Louisiana, called me. And he said, hey, Captain Del Dye wants you to call him on his cell phone. So I called him, and he said, Chief, oh, you know, I need you. You need to be here on this date at this time. I got all this stuff I need you to do. And just, it was pretty quick the way he was rattling off all this stuff. You know, and I'm just trying to let it sink in that, you know, I'm talking to Del Dye, <laughs> first of all, because, you know, he's a movie star as well as being a military advisor. But he was a military advisor for uh, Tom Hanks on... Uh, Saving Private Ryan. So, you know, Tom Hanks had used him many times before. Uh, <clears throat> so what I ended up doing is I ended up going out for four days. I met the director, the uh, director of photography, the first assistant director, second assistant director. Um, there was a few other people, but I met them on the USS Kid in Baton Rouge. It's a like a... Uh, old destroyer escort ship that's now a museum so they were uh, they were actually on the bridge taking pictures and uh, taking uh, measurements and molds of all the different stuff because they actually built a replica of the bridge of that ship on a soundstage in Baton Rouge which is where a lot of it was was filmed but we can, we can talk more about that later but um I went out and met them for four days and we went through the entire script of the movie and I got to help the director figure out like what the different words meant in the script. You know, there was a lot of naval terminology that nobody knew. So I got to answer all those questions. Also procedural things. You know, the director would say, this, this sounds kind of weird. You know, it says they do this. Would they actually do that in the Navy? And I would tell them, you know, you know, yes, sir, that's exactly what they do. Or no, that's, they would never do that. And then well, what would they do? So they would kind of pen and ink you know, some of the stuff of what they would really do. And uh, so that was fun. I got to do that. And then <clears throat> Captain Dye said, hey, all these principal actors are going to be flying in and I need you to teach a boot camp. So I'm going to give all these actors to you. You guys are going to go on the ship for one week and you're going to teach them everything they need to know how to act Navy. So, which he ended up having a kind of an itinerary of things he wanted me to cover. But so for one week, me and all these actors lived on the USS Kid <laughs> like we were in the Navy. We uh, slept in the 
you know, the birthings and the old World War II cots, you know, used the bathrooms there. Now, this movie production, it was a huge feature film, so they had a big budget, and they catered the food to us, so three times a day, they brought food to the ship, and it was, it wasn't hamburgers and french fries, baby. They, <laughs> it was delicacy. It was, the spread that this production bought us was unreal. Man, we ate good. It was amazing. And it spoiled me because the next set I went on, I'm like, hey, well, what is this garbage, man? What are we eating here? You know, where's my steak? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. So that was, that was kind of funny. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, so for a week, me and these guys, we marched, we practiced hand salutes, we uh, did facing movements. I made them run, I made them do team, you know, team sit ups and a lot of stuff like that. And then we walked around the ship and would talk about what you know, different things are and how to wear the uniform and the old gig line, you know. You know what that is, Google gig line. It's uh, something neat. Military people know what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> So after, um, after production started, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the crew, I think maybe it was the second assistant director, he came and said, hey, the, uh, the director wants you to uh, audition for a, a part that we have in the movie. There's, a, another, uh, there's another uh, role available. He wants you to audition for it. The auditions are going to be uh, matter of fact, it was on, uh, it was February 14th, it was on Valentine's Day of 2018, I remember it. Because uh, <clears throat> I remember telling the casting director, Happy Valentine's Day, because she was in a bad mood. Ooh, this girl, she was rough. I think they, they flew her from Georgia, and she didn't want to be there. You could tell, she was just pissed off. So when she came out and said, who's first? I was like... I walked all the way to the back of the line. Like I'm not dealing with her. Let you know, one of these young guys needs to take the first brunt of her wrath. And uh, so he went in, and we could hear her yelling at him. You know, all the way down the hall. So, but <clears throat> I figured out a good strategy. You know, there there was another door at the other end of the hall to that room, and I could hear what they were saying through the door. So. I went all the way down there and stood at that door so I would be last and I listened to every single person's audition. So I don't, I don't know if this is considered cheating or not. Well, maybe it's smart. If you're not cheating, you're not trying, right? Uh, don't, don't follow that advice. Disregard that. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> they all went through and she was giving them feedback a, a little bit, you know, not telling them how to do the audition, but she would give them a little bit of feedback so I got to hear all that. So by the time I got there, I mean, it was streamlined. I went in and boom, I hit everything I was supposed to hit. And I remembered everything she told them that was wrong. I corrected all that. When I got done, she said, thank you. That's all she said to me. There was no other feedback. She didn't tell me anything I did wrong. And I said, happy Valentine's Day. And I walked out and about, uh, I don't know, six or seven days later, uh, <clears throat> they came and brought me a script and it was opened up to my name, my character's name, and uh, my dialogue. So uh, that's how I got cast in the movie Greyhound. I went and did the audition and uh, I got it. So, and it was fun. <clears throat> you know, shooting Greyhound was fun. Uh, the set was massive. Um, you know, everybody asks me, what's Tom Hanks like? Uh, he's wonderful. He's just like, you like his characters in the movie, he acts just like his characters. Real laid back, you know, funny. He's got that unmistakable voice. Uh, you know, he would have us cracking up every day. You would think he would be like this, you know, mega way up in the clouds actor, you know, who thinks he's better than everyone else. Not at all, man. Not at all. He talked to everybody. Uh, they wouldn't let us take pictures with him. He had, a, he had a security guard who just, I mean, stuck right with him. This guy was on him. He couldn't go anywhere without him. And uh, he wouldn't let us really do anything other than, you know, talk to him. But when we'd get on the set, <clears throat> you know, just to shoot, then, you know, he would stay down off of the set, kind of at the ladder. But we would go up on this uh, big platform where they had the bridge of the ship built. 
it was on like a hydraulic platform so it looks like it's rocking and uh, we'd go up there and he would just tell jokes and have us cracking up so he was a lot of fun a lot of fun to work with uh, I did a burial at sea scene with him as probably the most I got to talk to him because uh, <clears throat> we had changed uh, we had changed the scene a little bit because he he had a like a little eulogy type thing he was going to read and uh, they changed to where he was going to read that first and then we'll bring the you know the crew to attention and then start the barrel see and then but before that we were going to bring everybody to attention then he was going to read it so so it was a little bit confusing so <laughs> i remember one time i was talking to the guy behind me and there was a tap on my shoulder and i turned and it's it was Tom Hanks, and he's like, he said, hey, am I, do I read first, and then you, you know, do your thing, or are you doing your thing, and then I read? And I said, uh, actually, the last thing I heard was that uh, you read first, and then when you're done, and they say, so bring the ship to a halt, then I'll do my thing. So you read, they'll ring the bells, then I'll bring everybody to attention and start the guns and all that stuff. He's like, okay. And then he starts to, uh, he starts to walk off. No, actually, he, he walked all the way over. Then he came back <clears throat> and he said, I just want to make sure I'm clear. I, I read first, right? I'm going first and then you. I was like, yes, sir. That's exactly, you got it. You got it, Skipper. <laughs> you know? And he said, okay. And then he turned around, it took about two steps and he turned, he goes, me first, right? <laughs> So, I mean, he's funny, you know, but I, man, I enjoyed that. And then <clears throat> they were supposed to ring the bells for me to do my, my first line and they didn't ring the bells. So the director called action and I'm just standing there waiting to hear the bells. And a long time was going by and I'm like, what the hell are they doing? And yeah, we're just like wasting, you know, media here. And then I hear, chief. I was like, does somebody say chief? Chief. And I like kind of looked over and it, Tom Hanks, who was standing over to the right a little bit with his officers, he's, he goes like, you know, <laughs> let's go. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm just gonna go without my cue, you know? So I, I went through it and then the director comes out when we cut and he's like, hey, what was that big long period? You know, there's like a long pause before you brought the ship's company to attention. I was like, well, I, I was waiting for my cue. I don't know. I mean, nobody told me that they were just not going to do the cue. We said, well, what, what is your cue? I was like, it's the bells. They got to ring the bells. Ding, ding. Now all hands bury the dead. Now all hands bury the dead. And, you know, I said, see the, in the script right here, that's, that's my cue. <laughs> and he's like, well, why didn't somebody, then he starts, you know, yelling at people like, well, why aren't they doing the cue? Somebody get over there and get the, you know, so the next time, then the bells rang and everything went fluid. Then we shot it like, you know, 46 different takes. And then I was like, <clears throat> I couldn't talk. I was doing espresso shots and they were bringing me uh, some sort of throat spray. And, but then after a while, the director said, uh, <clears throat> he said, no, no, I like it with your, your voice going out because it kind of, now it makes it more, sound more emotional. Like, you know, you're <clears throat> kind of getting choked up. So, <clears throat> but then uh, we did, uh, we did some ADR sessions, which is like additional dialogue recording. So sometimes if you're missing dialogue or you have to redo it, you do these ADR sessions. So I had to do two of them and which we re-recorded that entire scene. So none of the, you know, horse or the you know, sore throat, none of that sound even made it into the film anyway, because I re-recorded every single line. And then they added more dialogue, which was cool. Uh, it, when I first did it, they, the guys who, who they were burying or they were dumping over the side, their names weren't even mentioned. And when we did the ADR, we added the names in. So, little Greyhound trivia for you. Nice. So, after Greyhound, you transitioned through numerous smaller roles and mm -hmm. other things, and then you landed in <clears throat> Big Chronicles. Yeah. Yeah, so after Greyhound, I did, uh, I did another feature film, uh, which was a Chinese film, believe it or not. Uh, there was a, a Chinese director cast me 
in a role where <clears throat> I worked at a company. I was a boss of some some Chinese people. W one of them spoke English. <laughs> the rest of them didn't. So, and uh, the it's funny because the director and the the uh, the camera guy and the the second AC and all them they spoke a little bit of English. So I had to get the one guy to kind of help me translate, and then I had to end up rewriting most of the script because their translation into English for my parts made no sense at all. You can't translate it straight. It has to be chain Americanized, you know what I mean? So I had to rewrite a lot of it and then there were there was two scenes where there was no dialogue and they said they just we we need you to do this. I was like, we well, you do what? They said, well <clears throat> so they, they told the, the guy who could speak English we want him to do, you know, this essentially. This is the context. And then I just had to make it up. I had to just make up a whole scene. So anyway, I did that and it, it was pretty cool. It turned out well. And then I did, um, I did multiple uh, short films. Did a lot of short films. Uh, Cause there was, there was some good roles in the short films and it, you know, helps, helps you work on building character and work on your screen time and stuff like that. Um, now, starting in December of last year, I got uh, I got hooked up with this guy from L.A. He started the YouTube channel, and he was doing little shorts, uh, short films, and they were like kind of like inspirational, motivational. They all had like a a moral at the end of the the video. There's some sort of moral to be told, you know. So they'll they'll show somebody being crappy to another person. And then karma beats the piss out of the person who was crappy to the other one. You know, the moral story is don't be crappy to people, essentially. So <clears throat> most of the uh, the videos are just about, you know, trying to show people, you know, don't be a crappy human. Be a decent human being. You know, that's basically the, the bottom line, the focus. Uh, so I started out with one. I got cast in one. Uh, as a uh, like an abusive boyfriend, <laughs> really, I wasn't a very nice guy. Uh, so my girlfriend's daughter ended up getting pregnant at 15, and it pissed me off. And I kicked her out of the house, and I told her mom, "You better go dump her on the street, or you can go with her. I'll get rid of both of you." So the mother dumped the girl, 15 year old, out in a parking lot, and said, "I'm so sorry, baby. You know, good luck." Be safe and left, left this 15 year old downtown in a parking lot. So <clears throat> anyway, it ended up, the ending was good. So since December, I've done 70, I think about 70, about 76 of those videos so far. So done, done quite a few, done a lot of videos. And it's been fun so far. So, and a lot of people have asked me, you know, hey, what are you doing? Are, are you, are you going to be in any more movies? Are you doing, you know, short films? What are you doing TV? And um, right now, I, you know, I have applied for a few things. We'll see, you know, if I get cast in, in some other feature films. But uh, primarily, I'm, uh, I've kind of um, dedicated myself to Vid Chronicles because. <clears throat> You know, that channel just hit a million subscribers and, uh, you know, it, it's really growing fast and it's going places and there's, uh, you know, that production team is going to be shooting a feature film pretty soon. So uh, I should be able to roll into that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see where this channel goes and where the production team goes. So it's growing pretty rapidly. So I'm going to stick with Vic Chronicles for a while or for as long as I can. And, uh, you know, see what happens from there. But uh, you know, if I get uh, if I get cast in anything else, then uh, I might I might pursue other things as well. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, I think that's all we got. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> now that I've talked your head off, huh? Yeah. All's good. Ends ends good, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else you want to know? Nope. You good? All right. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. John Frederick signing off. Then I went to a digital electronics school, which teaches